began here just a moment ago, Rashmi and I were talking about uh, Alexis Sanderson, who's the greatest scholar of Hindu Tantra of all time. And oh, about now almost 50 years ago, he coined a term, the Kaula Reformation, um, which, according to which initiation of tantric mm, novices by yoginis came to be cast as an erotic encounter with the gruesome practice of being eaten by yoginis sublimated into the more attractive option of having sex with yoginis and taking the form of lithe beauties possessed of the power of flight. These yoginis initiated and transmitted transformative teachings to male humans through their sexual emissions, which was a sort of fluid gnosis. However, the earliest esoteric tantras, both Hindu and Buddhist, tell quite a different story. In these, initiation was a violent affair in which the yoginis and dakinis, as they're called in the Buddhist uh, tantra, would only offer tantric gnosis and initiations after having been gratified with the flesh and blood offered to them by male aspirants. The Hindu tantras frequently evoke the two alternatives faced by humans with regard to these female predators. While most were doomed to become food for the yoginis, the virile hero, the vira, the tantric virtuoso, could instead become the darling of the yoginis. However, in some cases, one could only become their darling by first passing through their digestive system. So a proof text for the incorporation of the yoginis into tantric, metaphysical, and soteriological systems is the ninth century CE Hindu Netra Tantra, whose 20th chapter is devoted to three types of yoga. The Netra is a Hindu Tantra compiled in Kashmir in about the year 825. It was considered to be a foundational work for several centuries. And we know this because Chemaraja, Abhinava Gupta's 11th century disciple and a great scholar in his own right, probably the second greatest scholar of Hindu Tantra after his teacher, Abhinava Gupta, Chemaraja wrote an extensive commentary on the Netra Tantra. And I found his commentary to be quite helpful when I translated this chapter a couple of years ago. And it's just now coming out in a collective volume uh, to be brought out by Oxford University Press. The 20th chapter of the Netra is devoted to what this text calls the three yogas, supreme, subtle, and gross. And you see what those are definable as in the central part of this slide here. Supreme yoga is basically being eaten by yoginis, subtle yoga, yogis taking over other people's bodies, that should sound familiar by now, and gross yoga, sorcery, and counter sorcery. So here the, the nature uses the word yoga in a literal sense. The primary meaning as we know of yoga is yoke. You yoke a bullock to a plow, you yoke a horse to a chariot. In both cases, you're yoking a very powerful creature with relatively fine um, devices, with strips of leather, uh, a wooden uh, yoke. And the three yogas are three types of yoking by means of which a practitioner controls his or her victim by binding them with subtle, which is here to say invisible means. All three of these tantric yogas involve these figures called yoginis, who are more or less specific to Hindu tantra, their Buddhist homologues, as I said, being called dakinis. They first appear in tantric art and scripture around the year 700, and I'll be showing you lots of images of yoginis from when their cult was at their height, particularly around the 10th to 12th centuries, which is the period slightly later than the Netra itself. 
So you've probably all heard of yoginis. And some of you may claim to be yoginis, but after you hear my talk today, you may want to reconsider that choice. So this is what many consider to be a yogini today. By the way, that's a real license plate uh, from when I lived in California, someone nearby had that license plate. In medieval India, yoginis were not female practitioners of yoga as we know it, but rather female practitioners of yoga as medieval India knew it. And they were these figures with live human bodies, but one or more animal or bird-like, or sometimes humanoid heads. And these images are from yogini temples. Um, they were open air structures, usually round, built between mostly 1000 and 1200 CE. And there's a small number of them that have survived down to the present day across India. The medieval yogini temples were open air because one of the default forms of the yoginis was that of a flying creature, a bird, maybe a bat. But yoginis were fundamentally shapeshifters who could transform into beautiful women and then back into a carrion feeding bird or a predatory mammal, especially a jackal, a female jackal to be precise. So the three yogas of the Netra Tantra, here's the verse nine to 10 of the 20th chapter that pretty much summarizes and encapsulates it. Trividhena tu yogena yogayanti shivajinaya parenaiva hi sukshmena stulena tritayena tu. By means of the three types of yoga, the yoginis yoke pursuant to Shiva's command. They yoke by means of this triad, by means of supreme yoga, subtle yoga, and gross yoga. The nature presents these three types of yoga in descending order, starting with supreme para yoga, being eaten by yoginis, and then continuing to subtle sukshma yoga, the practice of taking over people's bodies. And finally, the lowest form of yoga called gross yoga, stula yoga, which comprises various forms of sorcery, counter sorcery, black and white magic. I'm gonna discuss them in reverse order, starting with gross and going up to subtle and supreme. On the left is a photo I took of a painting from uh, the uh, city state of Patan in the Kathmandu Valley. Uh, don't know the date of it. People at this temple, the temple of the goddess with the severed head, Shinamasta, told me what this painting re represented. And it represents an, a witch, her daughter or her initiate, a younger soon to be witch, and her husband, whom she's leading by a rope. Um, suffice it to say that you know your marriage is in a bad place when your wife has put a rope around your neck. <laughs> She's leading him to be eaten by her fellow yoginis or at least sacrificed by them, according to what I was told. Gross yoga involves sorcery, which when practiced for selfish ends and the destruction of others, ultimately results in the practitioner being destroyed by their own evil. And when practiced for altruistic ends, for the protection of others, it's salutary to the practitioner, his family, his king, and the kingdom. So gross yoga is both how to destroy others, but also how to protect others from being destroyed. Actually, most of the discussion of gross yoga in the Netra is about how to protect from evil sorcerers and witches. The Sanskrit term used in the nature for sorcery is mantra vada, the doctrine of spells. However, in gross yoga, mantras are combined with other practices, such as the dust practice described by Kshemaraja in his commentary on Netra Tantra, chapter 20, verse 39. I note here that in his commentary, it's a yogini, a human witch in this case, who is a the practitioner, and I read to you what his commentary says. This is the dust practice. 
At dawn on the seventh day of the dark half of the lunar fortnight, the yogini shall observe a cremation ground landscape. The corpse of a woman that has appeared with the first light of dawn, as well as that of a man, she shall take hold of their left and right feet with her left and right hands and removing the dust that is on the right foot of the man together with the dust on the left foot of the woman, she shall always kill her victims. This is a practice that's persisted down into modern times, the dust practice. If you can get your hands on a couple dead bodies on a cremation ground, uh, you can collect that dust off their feet and theoretically do some wild and crazy things, which may be what this guy's doing here. There's his yogi there, sinister yogi, He's clearly created this monster who's carrying off the fair maiden who's being protected by the by valiant hero. And uh, we don't know what those two are doing there. So that is gross yoga. As with gross yoga, subtle yoga can be used for good or for evil ends. Yoginis or evil yogis will use it to take over bodies of their victims by reducing themselves to pellet size, so the word is gurtika, to enter into them and basically evict the body's owner. I've talked about this some already on Monday. That is by performing a kind of microsurgery using mantras as surgical instruments on the victim's sensory and mental faculties, energies, and everything that makes the victim a functioning individual and then drawing that victim's naked soul into his own, the you know, yogi's own body or the yogini's own body. And once this has been done, as I mentioned on Monday, the yogi or yogini can simultaneously inhabit their own body and that of their victim or victims. And of course, that's what that passage from the Mahabharata that I read to you on Monday said that a yogi can lay hold of several thousand selves and having obtained their power, he can walk the earth with all of them. So in this respect, we can say that subtle yoga is a kind of possession. The yogi or yogini possesses the body of the other person and does with it what he or she will. Uh, the word for possession is avesha. When possession is, let's say, altruistic or salutary, it's generally called samavesha, co-penetration. And actually one of my grad students wrote his dissertation on this samavesha for altruistic means. Um, came, uh, both the Netra Tantra and Kshemaraj in his commentary make it clear that this type of yoga, subtle yoga, possession is something that yoginis mothers and spirit beings do when they overpower their victims, but it also can be done by a human yogi. And this is what Shemaraja says in his commentary on Natra Tantra 2030. Well, let me see, I don't wanna get ahead of myself. Yeah, okay. So he writes, in his commentary on Natra 2030. Some of it's on the screen, some of it I'm just gonna to read to you. He, the yogi, sets the other person in motion. This means that the very thing that I, that is to say the yogi do, do, the other person shall do that very thing. So the yogi controls the other person. The yogi moves his right arm, the other person moves his right arm and so forth. That means that the yogi shall restrain the one who is intending to go and he shall compel the one who's still standing to move Remember, that's what uh, Vipala did to Ruchi. She wanted to stand up, he paralyzed her, she couldn't get up. She wanted to say nice things to Indra, he paralyzed her tongue so she spoke in correct Sanskrit and spoke to him like an honored guest. Gener gradually, the yogi shall make him dependent upon the movement of his own, the yogi's own limbs. This has been said by the gurus. Stationed there in the heart of his victim, he proves himself as a yogi, when the result of his action, total simultaneity, simultaneity of movement has been realized, whether he be eating, drinking, moving, standing or sleeping. After that, the yogi may use him, cast him off, lead him astray, make him open his eyes, fill him up or cause him to reach the most excellent abode. So it's all naked 
sorry, it's all negative. Or, it all has a negative connotation until you get to that last clause. Cause him to reach the most excellent abode means cause the victim to realize liberation or heaven or something like that. And here again, we have an echo of that passage that I read you from the Mahabharata on Monday, which concluded with this declaration, without a doubt, the powerful yogi who is a master of binding others is also possessed of the absolute power to release others from those same bonds. So you can use subtle yoga for good or for evil, for yourself or for others. And what this last clause means was unpacked by Gopinath Kaviraj. Anyone who's lived in Benares and has had uh, doings with the uh, Benarsi uh, intellectual world uh, or has read his countless works on Tantra knows that Gopinath Kaviraj was this great professor, administrator, scholar, practitioner uh, of Tantra who died in uh, the 1970s in Varanasi. In fact, I, he was dying when I first came there, the very first time I was there as an undergraduate in the mid 70s. And I remember I had just heard of him and someone said, well, you can actually meet him at the BHU hospital. And I, I didn't because I was this little undergraduate. And he was this giant. This is what Gopinath Kaviraj has to say about that passage I just read to you. Concentration normally implies a bodily support, but for yogis, disembodied concentration is also a requirement. By disembodied concentration, we mean that the mind stuff located inside the body, outside of the body, is a different place. The body contains multiple mind-bearing channels. It is not the case that these channels are solely inside the body. They also fan out from the body into the entire cosmos. By means of this network of channels, every man is joined together with every other man. It's a very interesting understanding of where one person lets, leaves off and another begins. We're all kind of attached to each other. And what does he say? Why is this so? because everything is connected to everything else. A yogi becomes empowered to undertake this practice known as enhanced disembodied concentration. And it is this that makes entering into another person's body possible. A yogi's root mind remains in his body while a separate mind voluntarily inhabits another body and is yoked to that other body. But both remain joined by a luminous thread-like substance. And then discussing the connection between yogically entering foreign bodies to tantric initiation, Kaviraj continues. When a yogi's mind that has fully penetrated another body then returns to its own place, his own body, it then takes a portion of the mind that it has separated off from that other body and brings it back with it, back to the guru's body or the yogi's body. In addition, a portion of the guru's mind is left behind in the body of his disciple where it remains for a long time, even until the disciple's death. Thus, the disciple's mind becomes dependent on that of the guru. At the time of the disciple's death, the portion of the guru's mind that had remained with the disciple draws out the disciple's mind and returns to his, the guru's own body. When the disciple's mind merges with the guru's mind, then the guru's body, after having come to the guru's place in the guru's body, he, the disciple, attains a plane of being equal to that of the guru. Upon arriving at that place, that is upon attaining that plane of being within the guru's body, he enters into an unaging and immortal state and is saved from the world of death. The more, the more people's bodies a yogi is able to make his own by entering into foreign bodies, the greater number of bodies will be pervaded by his mind and the more he will be able to use his own action energy for the general welfare in his all pervasive 
form. I think that's just an amazing statement. He's saying that when a guru initiates a disciple, he leaves a bit of his mind in the disciple's body and takes a bit of the disciple's mind into his own body. When the guru himself, who's fully liberated, is read, let's put it this way, when the disciple dies, that part of his mind that was in the guru's mind is now one and the same with the guru. So the disciple is in the same liberated state as the guru. So by initiation, gurus liberate their disciples, not immediately, but at the time of the disciple's death. Now, how does that play into tantric initiation? This is how subtle yoga functions in tantric initiation. And this is kind of a standard tantric initiation. Uh, it's expressed in concrete terms in some of the early tantric works called the agamas, gets repeated for several centuries. So first the guru enters into the initiate's body. Oops, sorry. Envelops the initiate's soul with his own and brings it back into his own body. Second, he raises both his own and the initiate's soul up to this top of the dvadashanta, that position, that's location 12 fingers breadths above the top of his head, which is where Paramashiva, the Supreme Shiva, inhabits. So he brings both his own and the yogi's, uh, the disciple's soul up to the world of Shiva. And then once that process has been completed, the guru brings both of their souls back down, returns his own to his own body, and returns his disciple's soul to his own body. But through initiation, the disciple has already been taken to the world of Shiva. He's been liberated provisionally, which means at the time of his death, that liberation shall become actual, actualized. And this is why tantric gurus are worshipped as saviors, as gods. They are truly the saviors of their disciples. They save them for all time by initiation. In the case of supreme yoga, as described in the Netra Tantra, the yoginis affect the salvation of humans by entering into their living bodies and killing them. Over the past decades, a great deal has been written and said about so-called tantric sex, probably too much of it by me in my book, Kiss of the Yogini. And while there can be no doubt that the sacramental use of sex sexual fluids produced from sexual intercourse was an integral part of the tantric synthesis, relatively little has been, attention has been paid to tantric violence, such as that shown on this image a decapitated goddess having sex with a corpse, the corpse of Shiva, is collecting her own blood in a skull chalice for future consumption, whilst jackals, and I put jackals in sort of quotation marks, are feeding on severed human heads. As I said at the beginning of my talk, the sexual practices associated with medieval tantra were the result of a reform that occurred near the end of the first millennium. One of the earliest forms of cremation ground asceticism undertaken by tantric yogis was to venture alone into these fearsome landscapes, cremation grounds, lonely mountaintops, in the dead of night and offer up their bodies to the yoginis, these noisy hordes of flesh-eating creatures that preyed on the bodies of the living and the dead. Post-Reformation ritual sublimated the gruesome into the sublime, being eaten by yoginis into having sex with yoginis. So tantric violence, death by yoginis, is the more attractive option that, I'm sorry, is the less attractive option and is the topic of the Natra Tantra's discussion of supreme yoga. So supreme yoga, it, it may be taken as a tantric explanation for the problem of evil. That is why innocent people die 
but more importantly, why death at the hands and the feet and the stomachs of the yoginis is a supreme path to salvation. And that's why it's called supreme or transcendent, this word para. And as I'll show, this supreme yoga is synonymous with another term frequently found in the Hindu tantric record, and that is hatha melaka, violent consorting. So as I'll unpack the Netra Tantra's 15 verses on Supreme Yoga, explain why the yoginis exist as part of Shiva's universal plan, why they're called female yokers, because that's what yogini literally means, a female figure that yokes. It explains that the yogini's destruction of their victims' bodies is not killing, but rather a means to their liberation, their identity with Shiva. And it explains that the yoginis are feminine forms of Shiva himself. So the Netra Tantra's 20th chapter, what you see on the left is a yogini eating an arm, starting with the fingers. This is from central, uh, from Maharashtra, one of my students took this photo. And then this is from a Japanese um, womb mandala from a couple centuries later, which shows three Dakinis basically doing the same thing. So I wanna dwell here on this phrase, those feminine forms of Shiva from Netra Tantra 2015. But before that, let me just read these important passages from that 20th chapter. They, the yoginis, rightly slaughter the god of gods, victims, Pashu, for the purpose of sacrifice. Pashus are used for sacrifice to the Lord and not otherwise. And it is out of grace that they, the yoginis, release those victims from their sins. They cut away those heaps of sin. The victims who have been eaten by them go to the supreme abode, that is to say Shiva's heaven for all time. They, the yoginis, are agitated by the yoking, the, the, the binding of victims to the sacrifice and impelled by Shiva to sacrifice those victims. And by virtue of their attachment to him, those feminine forms of Shiva, Shiva Rupa, are unsullied by their sacrifice of victims to him. In the same way that identity with Shiva is obtained by means of yoking, yoga, in initiation, so too do they, those victims, attain identity with Shiva by the yoking, yoga, of the ones who yoke. And there the term yoga is actually yogi, um, but in these texts, yogi can be shorthand for both the male and female. So. In this case, yogini is more appropriate because yogis don't eat their victims, yoginis do. Finally, the yoginis crunch the fetters of their victim. And the, the verb is throat. It's kind of an onomato poetic word. Throat, throat is crunch, crunch. The victim, they, they crunch the fetters of their victims. The fetters are called pashas and they are what differentiate creatures from God there are three pashas, three fetters, and once those are removed, there is no difference between a creature, a pashu, and God, pati. Um, and so by removing, by eating those fetters that are, are basically the bodies of their victims, the yoginis destroy the body, and then I finish the final verse here, liberation that is realized by means of the destruction of a body composed of fetters, is assuredly not killing. Thus, Supreme Yoga has been explained. So let me dwell on this feminine forms of Shiva that the yoginis are said to be. Shiva is Shiva's in his feminine form. Shiva is Shiva. Shiva would be the same thing as Shakti, a feminine form of Shiva. But in Sanskrit, Shiva also means jackal. So, Yoga, supreme yoga, means being eaten by feminine forms of Shiva, Shivas, which can be read as being eaten by jackals. Yoga then is the yoginis eating of the fetters, the pashas that bind pashus to samsara, that differentiate victims, pashus, from pati, Shiva. Therefore, by eating those fetters, yoga is the yoking, the yoga, 
of the individual soul to Shiva. And yoga is also initiation by the yoginis into their clan of yogic virtuosi, which is to say viras, um, uh, humans aspiring to the elite practices of Hindu Tantra, which involve not only liberation, but also supernatural powers in the world called siddhis. So bearing in mind that Shiva means both female form of Shiva and jackal, I turn to this lovely miniature painting that's held by the Metropolitan Museum. It's dated from 1630 to 1635, attributed to a North Indian artist named Payag, who was employed in the service of the Imperial Mughals uh, shortly after the death of Akbar. Akbar died a couple decades before 1630, if I'm not mistaken. Payag was a Hindu, and clearly he or the person who commissioned this work had some familiarity with Hindu Tantra. Now the Metropolitan Museum has labeled this uh, miniature as the goddess Bhairavi Devi with Shiva. I think it's a misinterpretation. Uh, the goddess may well be Bhairavi Devi. Bhairavi is a tantric form of the goddess and this is certainly a tantric looking goddess. But the figure on the left, I would say is certainly not Shiva. By the way, He's got this little horn right here. And I'm gonna talk about these horns at some length in my lecture following this one. Here I'm gonna argue that this image is actually a portrayal of the ideal outcome of transacting with these powerful and dangerous yoginis by becoming their victim. And by becoming their victim, by allowing himself to be eaten by them, a tantric yogi becomes identical to Shiva. He becomes a second Shiva, possessed of the supernatural powers that the yoginis grant him in exchange for supreme yoga, the yoga of offering up his body or his vital fluids to the yoginis. I'm also going to argue, and I can't prove it, but you can take it for what it's worth, that Bhairavi, the, fem the single female figure on the right, is to be viewed as a representation of multiple yoginis. But those jackals in the foreground, for me, are also yoginis. So this yogi on the cremation ground is surrounded by yoginis, by jackals, of which one or many eventually manifest in their human form, which is the red goddess you see to the right. So first, there's the gruesome aspect of the goddess, the blood spurting from her mouth, the profusion of human skulls on her lap, and the corpse that she's sitting on. In the miniature on the right, however, this gruesome and the erotic are intertwined because Shiva, the corpse on this burning funeral pyre over which Kali stands in her terrible form, Shiva has an, an erection. Note that in the foreground, you have jackals, those aren't dogs. You see the, the striped tails on them? They are jackals. Also note that there are carrion feeding birds in the same image. And I would suggest that these are kites, chilla, those same great birds that I showed you in the photograph of the Jodhpur fort, where these great birds were flying around the top of the fort. And I said, these were the yoginis flying around the hill called Chiryanat, the Lord of the Birds, which is the name of that hilltop in Jodhpur. So the jackals are as important to these compositions as the human and divine figures. And the reasons for this may be found in his art historical as well as textual sources. Cremation or charnel grounds, which were the natural habitat for such carrion feeders and predators were also the haunts of tantric yogis and of the tantric goddesses variously referred to as yoginis, grahanis, dakinis, or matris, female Caesars and mothers. And so it is that when you look at images of tantric goddesses, 
they're often portrayed together with jackals. This jackal's head's been cut off. Jackals, jackals, jackals. This jackal on the wall of a goddess temple with an arm in its mouth will be the subject of a later discussion here in just a few minutes. This proclivity of jackals for eating the bodies of the dead and the living in charnel grounds is attested from early Buddhist literature down to the present day. And quite often, oh yeah, this is another wonderful representation of the goddess Kali on a hilltop as goddesses so often are in these traditions uh, on which jackals eating flesh are figured prominently as well as our carrion eating birds and this fellow <laughs> uh, you can see that feeding on human flesh is what's going on here and jackals are very much involved in that so again i would say you have yoginis in this form and perhaps in this form and then the great yogini bhairavi kali she goes by several names uh, at the center of this circle of yogis. So quite often this identification between jackals and tantric goddesses is explicit as attested in this passage from the Kula Chidamani Tantra. Uh, as I recall, this is 14th or so century in which the practitioner offers food to jackals. I'll read the full passage here. The person who does not worship the goddess in some lonely spot in her creaturely jackal form has everything immediately destroyed upon hearing the howl of a jackal. The jackal seizes everything and uttering a course, she goes off to wail in a solitary place, note of the jackal's female. With the feeding of but a single jackal, a person gains the favor of all the shaktis. This is how the animal shakti, the human shakti, and also the bird shakti are to be worshiped. That's the yoginis in their three forms. The practitioner who is anxious about the positive and negative consequences of a given matter should bring an offering with the words, take, O goddess, O most fortunate one, O jackal, take your offering. And here they are. Jackal-headed yoginis, they are not powdering their noses, they're eating bits of human flesh. So in the light of these data, I would argue that in addition to being weapons, the arrow tips in her hair, these are also there to mimic the pointed ears of the jackals that are her alternate representation, her alternate manifestation. This because the tantric goddesses such as the yoginis were reputed to be shape changers, kama rupini, who could transform themselves instantly from animal to bird to human forms. Transformations that were fueled by precisely eating the flesh of their victims. This is what gave them the energy to transform from one shape to another. And I would also argue that this is what happens in the case of that Mughal miniature where a jackal becomes the humanoid form of the goddess Bhairavi, but still surrounded by her entourage of yoginis in the form of jackals. So, once again, a yogini manifesting in her humanoid form, yoginis in their jackal forms, a yogi who is undergoing supreme yoga, also known as violent consorting, which you see here. This identification is supported in several textual sources, including a Sanskrit poem by an 11th century Kashmiri poet, Shemendra, which can be read in either of two ways, as a description of a man being taken in an erotic embrace by his lover, or of a human corpse being eaten by a jackal. How can that be read in two different ways? In Sanskrit poetics, you have this device called shlesha, whereby if you break up the divisions between words in different places, there is a shlesha, a slippage in the meaning. So the same words in a row can describe as Chemendra's ingenious verse does, 
a man make, being made love to by his lover or a corpse being eaten by a jackal. So this poem points to the two ways in which it was possible for a male to relate to the yoginis. He could either become food for the yoginis, which is also called hatha melaka, violent consorting, or he could become the darling of the yoginis, known as priya melaka, affectionate consorting. Jackals that devour their human victims are brought to the fore in a tantric rite described in two of the earliest extant Hindu tantric scriptures, which likely predate our Netra Tantra by a century or more. These are the circa 8th century Jayadrata Yamala and Brahma Yamala. In these, the practice that I've been describing is not called para yoga, but rather Hatha Melaka, violent consorting. But the process and the results are the same. The Brahma Yamala tells us that by being eaten by the yoginis, a yogi is reborn as the leader of their circle. And once again, the benefits of becoming food for the yoginis only accrue after they have eaten you. It's kind of like, I don't know if this is strike a bell with all of you, but people who call themselves born again Christians, they sometimes forget that you have to die first. In this case, to become a lover of the yogini, you have to be eaten by them before you can actually be reborn as a lover and uh, leader of the yoginis. In what appears to be a modern day survival of certain elements of this practice, a festival celebrated today in these very days in Kathmandu, on the dark of the moon in early spring, so in about a month or two, well, three months from now, features a simulated human sacrifice to the tantric goddess Vatsala, in which a jackal god and a jackal king figure prominently. This has been written up by Axel Mikhails, the German uh, anthropologist. And as he describes it, the night comes to a glorious end as the jackal king, that is to say the tantric priest, channeling the jackal god, howls like a jackal. In the three days that follow, a series of processions and animal sacrifices take place. These, however, mask a now lost tradition of human sacrifice to Vatsala, in which jackals played a leading role. The Nepali royal chronicles repeatedly report that Vatsala once demanded humans, and several chronicles refer to the loud cries made by the man jackal. As Mikhail's surmises, presumably the human sacrificial victims were given to the jackals, of which there were many in the area around the Vatsala temple, as suggested by the chronicles, which relate that the jackals howled so loudly that the people became deaf. And even today, the site of the funeral pyre there is called Jambu Deepa, literally the light of or the light for the jackals, Jambu is another word for jackal. And the legacy of these practices can be viewed even today on the wall of the Batsala temple where this image of a jackal with a human arm in its mouth is repainted every seven years. The temples from the 14th century, this particular image cannot be any more than seven years old. We don't know how long ago they started painting this on the wall, perhaps all the way back to the 14th century, but according to Mikhail's reconstruction, until very recent years, humans were sacrificed to jackals at the temple of a tantric goddess. At the times that such would have normally have taken case, place the dark of the moon and the dead of night. The discussion of uh, violent consorting of Yogini Melaka, which has recently been analyzed by Olga Serbaeva, is longer and more detailed. So this is now we're going back to the eighth century. The work describes the conditions under which the yogis entered, interacted with the yoginis on cremation grounds and lonely mountaintops on the dark of the moon. There the yogis would offer themselves up in sacrifice, yielding up their bodies to the yoginis in what was termed the practice of Hatha Melaka. And as Serbaeva notes, the practices described here in these practices 
The yogini with which the yogi interacted was a blood drinking non-human entity. And the text describes them as making bizarre sounds with their mouths and filling the night with the cries of chilla, it's a, the bird, the kite, that same bird that was flying around the Jodhpur fort that I said was the bird form of the yoginis, chilla ravam, and jackals, shiva ravam, and other predators. So, supreme yoga, also known as violent consorting, is the offering of one's body to the yoginis to be eaten, by means of which one either becomes simply identical to Shiva, liberated, or in the case of a tantric yogi, the powerful lord and leader of the yoginis who have previously eaten him. So returning to the male figure in the Mughal miniature, who I said is not Shiva himself, but rather a yogi, as I said, the Metropolitan Museum of Art labels him as Shiva. I believe he should be viewed as a human yogi who has obtained identity with Shiva through supreme yoga, that is by having been eaten by jackals. And I say this for two reasons. He has two arms, so he's a human yogi. He doesn't have four arms like Shiva, even if, as the image on the right shows, Shiva in his standard iconography, when he takes the form of a wandering ascetic, Murti, he is depicted as having two arms. I will insist, however, that this is a human yogi emulating or embodying the god Shiva as indicated by his regalia, his ash smeared body, the trident and the two headed drum, Domaru next to him, the garland of skulls, so this is a case of double mimesis, not unusual in tantric contexts in which the God imitates the human, imitating the God. Why else do I say he's human? He doesn't have Shiva's face. He has a human face. He doesn't have Shiva's hair. He has this horn around his neck, which is typical of yogis in ways I'll describe later today. And there's this, and I'll also come to this in a moment. So there's this small tongue of flame in, emitted from the yogi's mouth. This is an artistic representation of the fact that he's uttering a mantra, a tantric spell, while blowing outward is something called pumka chalana in modern day Hindi. Shiva, the supreme god of Hindu tantra, doesn't need to pronounce mantras. He is Shiva. Mantras are spells used by human practitioners in the practice of gross yoga, for example. So is it his mantra that has caused the yogini to manifest in her human form? Or is it his offering of his own or some other victim's flesh and blood that has attracted her to him in her humanoid form? So let's return to the topic of supreme yoga in the Natra Tantra, which tells us that through supreme yoga, the male practitioner who has offered himself up as food for the yoginis realizes identity with Shiva by means of the yoking of the ones who yoke. And I'd say that our yogi has succeeded in becoming a second Shiva, even though he didn't start out as Shiva because of this. He has a halo around his head and there's a moon inscribed in that halo. And this is an essential element of Shiva's iconography. As you see in this fifth century Ekamukhi Lingam where she, there's a crescent moon in Shiva's matted hair. So what I think we're seeing in this painting is the image of a yogi who has succeeded in his practice of supreme yoga or violent consorting with the yoginis. Through his use of a mantra combined with his heroic charnel ground practice, he's compelled a goddess or yogini to abandon her predatory animal form and to manifest as a beautiful humanoid goddess, which he as a second Shiva that I may enjoy either as a consort, either through the use of mantras or because he's already been eaten alive by her and her, con, uh, her, con, her entourage in their animal forms. So this is the tantric yoga of a yoga, of a yogi and a yogini as re revealed in the Netra Tantra, the Brahma Yamala and Rudra Yamala, seminal works of medieval Hindu Tantra 
as well as in rituals observed in modern day Kathmandu. All right, that is my talk. First thing I want to share with you yes. is something that Rashmi and I were referring to. Yes. And yes. this is the quote unquote standard image of Chinamasta, mm. the severed headed goddess who's drinking from her own, of her own blood, flanked by two female figures who are also doing the same. I think this is the Sushumna, the Ida, and the Pingala, but I could be wrong. And then the, it's all happening on top of the Manipura Chakra, where Kama and Rati are engaged in reverse sexual intercourse. So there's a lot going on there. With that, I'm going to go to my presentation here. Thank you. Yeah. A lot of my talk, <clears throat> this final talk, is going to discuss the particular religious order known as the Nath Yogis. I mentioned them a couple times already on Monday in particular. Uh, this is a picture I took of Samundra Nath, a solitary Nath Yogi living in a cave below Mount Abu in Rajasthan. That state was a powerful power base, important power base for the Nath Yogis for several centuries but by the 1990s, they had generally fallen on hard times throughout India with their monast monasteries nearly empty and their numbers greatly reduced. And this is a trend that began early in the 19th century with the British finding themselves stymied in many of their colonial projects by well-organized, armed and belligerent ascetic orders passed a series of laws called the Vagrant Acts which rendered many of the activities of the yogis punishable by imprisonment. In tandem with this, many of the yogi orders were classified as criminal castes under the British codification of the caste system with staged images of yogis such as these, uh, yogi degenerates such as these photographed for the ethnographic archive. The scorn of the British wasn't altogether unfounded as several travelers report, 18th and 19th century India was overrun by yogis who specialized in mobbing pilgrimage sites and marketplaces, where in addition to engaging in dubious forms of public behavior, would basically shake down merchants and pilgrims in various forms of extortion. So it's not surprising that virtually all European accounts of the Indian yogis bemoan the fact that no true yogis remained in India with the only authentic yogis, those living high in the Himalayas where no one could find them. British legislation, together with changes in India's economic and religious landscapes, the religious, sorry, the railroad and bhakti religion would take their toll with the power, privilege and prestige and numbers of yogis plummeting. And it would not be inaccurate to characterize the period between 1857, the time of the mutiny, and the late 1990s as the low point in yogi fortunes in South Asia. But prior to the mid 19th century, as well as in very recent years, yogis did and have enjoyed great power and prestige. Travelers like the 13th century Italian Marco Polo and the 14th century Moroccan Ibn Battuta portray the yogis as wonder workers who prolonged their lives to hundreds of years through alchemy, diet, and practice. This image from Kajaraho shows figures mixing something up in a mortar and pestle next to a sexual practice. And uh, this may be interpreted as some combination of uh, alchemy and uh, sexual therapy that I'll return to here momentarily. On the right, you see two figures doing something similar, either stirring a pot or pouring something into it. This image is from Cambodia, from Angkor Wat. It's from the same temple, the Bayon, as the image of the multiple images of Jayavarman the seventh. Uh, that you see carved in the rock around 1200 CE. 
Jayavarman was a Buddhist, and these may be representations of him as the Buddhist um, Bodhisattva, Vajrasattva. However, his successor, Jayavarman VIII, um, for reasons that aren't entirely clear, became the follower of Shaivism. And so on the lower um, registers at the same temple, down at near ground level, you have these sort of comic strip uh, series of images of the coming of the Shaivas to Angkor Wat. And if you've been there, you know that it's located next to the largest inland lake of Southeast Asia, Tanle Sap. And in the olden days, Angkor Wat was like Venice. Uh, it was fed by canals that the water came from Tanle Sap. And this is actually a ship, a boat. There's the, there's the rear of it. There's the line of it. There's fish and alligators swimming underneath. And on the boat, you have basically a floating Shiva temple. You see the trident up there. And there's the guy doing the alchemy on the boat next to other figures dancing and wearing the, this is how the jata, the uh, matted locks of the Shiva, the Shaiva tantric practitioner were represented on these uh, sculptures. There's a dancing tantrika there. So, to uh, come back to the point, a um, certain number of travelers in medieval India were impressed by the yogi's knowledge of alchemy. And these powers and their reputed esoteric knowledge made them attractive to rulers of medieval kingdoms across the Hindu world. In the Middle Ages, a period in which there was no centralized authority, no great empire or kingdom in the North at least, tantric orders, were patronized by petty kings and warlords who relied on their supernatural powers to protect them from their enemies, to ensure victory on the battlefield. And in this context, tantric specialists often played the roles of power brokers, tantric yogi. The medieval and early modern North India military market was flooded with mercenary soldiers who put on the guise of yogis, I talked about this on Monday, or, or who actually belong to one or another yogic order. And at times, these military orders would fight each other in vying for patronage or simply to assert their claim over a piece of turf. And according to the Akbar Nama, the then young Mughal emperor Akbar, whom you see in his typical guise riding a horse here, he came upon a sort of pitch battle between armies of sannyasis and yogis near the modern day site of Ambala in the Punjab. The then young emperor threw his support to the losing sannyasi side who then won the battle and the yogis were subsequently routed and their leader beheaded. But more often than not, the yogis came up on top in this period, not only winning the including winning the later support of Akbar himself. Just want you to notice these disc-shaped objects on the ground that I'll come back to in a moment. So the yogis are the ones that are in gray because they're smeared with ashes. And the sannyasis are uh, a more uh, Brahman, let's say a more uh, conventional yogic order than the yogis. So, fighting yogis. This purportedly featuring a group of Naga sannyasi, although it seems that yogis of many different stripes are being represented here. And then this image I showed you before, the Naga sannyasis at the Kumbha Mela. You may know that at earlier Kumbha Melas during the British time, uh, there was great. Excuse me, can you please uh, thank you? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, David, sorry about at that. At these uh, Kumbha Melas, there were, there, fights would break out, actual armed battles with many dead would break out among the various um, renunciate orders in terms of who should get into the water first. Mm -hmm. And this was about, same thing, fighting over turf among different militarized yogi, or let's say ascetic orders in medieval and colonial period, India. 
This is an image from a more recent Kumbh Mela. And uh, yeah, they have weapons. So Akbar though, going back to him, his dates that he ruled was from 1556 to 1605. He was so fascinated by the yogis that he had a structure built for them at his capital of Fatehpur Sikri called the City of Yogis. And he was especially curious about their alchemical knowledge as evidenced in a story heard by John Marshall, a British subject some 65 years after Akbar's death. Um, so the, this is an image from around the time of Akbar. Akbar ruled from 1556 to 1605 of yogis. They have this distinctive uh, earrings and also once again, these horns that I'll come back to. I don't know if that's supposed to be Akbar or some other Mughal noble, but in any case, these yogis are portrayed sympathetically uh, and uh, such was the case, at least during Akbar's reign, he had great respect and even veneration of the yogis. But here's a story that was told to John Marshall 65 years after Akbar's death. Uh, the story is uh, titled often Yogi Akbar. During Akbar's reign, there was said to have lived a yogi who could fly through the air with the aid of a pellet of quicksilver that he held in his mouth. One day en route to the shrine of Jagannatha in Orissa, this yogi chanced to alight on the terrace of the emperor's harem for a nap. While the yogi slept, the pellet of quicksilver slipped from his mouth. Akbar chanced to fly, sized up the situation, and seized the pellet of quicksilver. When the yogi awoke, he assured the emperor that he had not meddled with his women of the harem and begged him to return his quicksilver, without which he could not fly. The emperor demanding instead that the yogi teach him a few tricks. Uh, everyone wants yogis to do tricks for them. Remember that yogi I met in the Trader Joe's parking lot. He did a trick for me. The yogi agreed to do a trick, and he offered to put his soul, yogi's soul, into any living creature. Akbar had a deer brought forth upon which the yogi demonstrated. Apparently unconvinced, the emperor requested that his own soul be put into the deer. The yogi complied with this request, and then brought the emperor back into his own body. Akbar was so frightened by the power of the yogi that he quickly ordered his guards to kill him. The order was duly carried out, but afterwards, people began noticing a change in the emperor's demeanor. Immediately after the execution of the yogi, the king was extremely altered, and all his life long, all his life long after lived a retired life, which was for about 10 or 11 years. And as to all his disposition, he was perfectly altered. And any that went to him would not have known by his discourse or actions that he was the same man as before. So Marshall concludes, the Moors, by which he refers to the Muslims, say that when he ordered the yogi to be killed, that the yogi changed souls with the king. And so it was the king's soul that was gone and the yogi's soul that remained in the king. So that's a story that we're familiar with by now. Now returning to this image, this disc-shaped object in the yogi's hand is one that actually is attested in literature. It's a weapon that's been described in a few places. So for example, the Italian traveler Ludovico di Vartema circa 1606 gave this account. The follower of the king of the yogis of Gujarat generally carry a little horn, that's that horn I've shown you a couple of times, at their neck. It's called a singnad, it's a deer horn whistle. That's part of the yogis standard equipment. Some of them carry a stick with a ring of iron at the base. Others carry iron, certain iron dishes which cut all around like razors and they throw these with a sling when they wish to injure anyone. And therefore when these per people, the yogis, arrive at any city in India, everyone tries to please them 
or should they even kill the first nobleman of the land, they would not suffer any punishment because they are said to be saints. However, these saints were more feared than respected. As the same Divartema relates, the same king of the yogis received a payment of 100 dukats from a Muslim ruler in the region of Calicut for the killing of two Portuguese spies. And uh, Divartema describes their gruesome end. He writes, the king of the yogis immediately sent 200 men to kill the said two Christians. And when they went to their house, they began to by tens to sound their horns once again and demand alms. And when the Christians began to fight, these yogis cast at them certain pieces of iron which are made round like a wheel and they threw them with a sling and struck John Marie on the head and Pierre Antonio on the head so that they fell to the ground. And when they ran upon them and cut open the veins of their throats and with their hands, they drank their blood. Sinister yogis indeed. So at the same Kajraho where this sculpture is found, engraved into the upper reaches of the Lakshman temple, Ibn, Bahut, Ibn Batuta, the Moroccan traveler, relates the following. At Kajraho, there lives a body of yogis. They have a kind of a horn, which they blow at daybreak and at the close of the day at night. And their whole condition is extraordinary. One of them made pills for Sultan Giyas Uddin al-Damghari, the king of Mawar. Pills which the latter was to take for strengthening his pleasure of love. That pleased the Sultan, who took, more, took them in more than necessary quantity and died. He was succeeded by his nephew, Nasir Uddin, who honored this yogi and raised his rank. Now, there have been several, just in passing, these images uh, from the same Jodhpur manuscript as I showed you on Monday, and I'll show you more from the same workshop uh, later in my lecture today. So goddess Shiva and their entourage represented as armed fighters. There, there, and there, and there. And this so-called not yantra, again, with armed yogis, and presumably yoginis, since some of them are female. There have been several not hagiographies, many of them from Jodhpur in Rajasthan, for reasons that I'll explain in a moment. But this one, the exemplary Deeds of Mustanat with the subtitle The Venerable Mustanat's Supernatural Sport, or the exposition of the Venerable Mustanat's Supernatural Sport, encapsulates a host, that is to say, it encapsulates the, ha the hagiographies of a host of Nath yogis. Uh, so Mustanat sort of becomes, in a single person, the embodiment of other illustrious Nath yogis that preceded him most particularly Goraknath, the founder of the Nats Yogis. Um, it's unusual because this hagiography has actually been edited and published. It was probably written in the late 19th to early 20th centuries. So about a hundred years after the death or the Samadhi of the historic figure Mastanath and the Yogi Chaitanath, there's his name there, uh, was at the Astal Bohar Monastery in Haryana that was founded by Mastanath. So the hagiography begins with lots of sort of standard miracles. He's born the son of a barren woman after that woman's husband uh, had had a meeting with Goraknath. Once he's born, he performs lots of miracles while he's still a baby. They find him uh, lying on the ground in a cradle at home, but he's also out in the fields where the cowherds are. He makes it rain when it is a drought. He brings milk when there's no milk. He brings fishes when there's no fishes. He raises cows from the dead. And when he's around 12 years old, he takes initiation uh, into the Nath yogis with a Nath named Gambhir Nath. Uh, at that time, he reveals to a meeting of the 12 Nath punts, as they're called, the suborders of the Nath yogis, that the entire universe is in his body. Again, yogi's body as universe. 
Uh, he blesses a village. He drives away sorrows. He brings rain. He restores the bodies of the lame. He restores a humpbacked woman to wholeness. And he's recognized to be the embodiment of the founder of the Nath Yogis, Goraknath himself. But he's not all good. He's not. This is a hagiography of a Nath Yogi written by a Nath Yogi. So, in one chapter of this hagiography, in the country of Patiala, Mustanath, that's the name of this figure, so the Lord of Intoxication, something like that. Mustanath competes with the abbot of a nearby monastery for the alms of the people in the village. He's not getting any alms, and so Mustanath curses the village. He has Mataraj dump piles of tattered cloth when yogis wear clothes, they would wear these sort of vests made out of rags. And uh, they have them dump these piles of tattered cloth in the middle of the village, telling the townspeople to take all that rubbish to the monastery and dump it there. The abbot refuses to accept the rubbish, and he tells the town, oh, sorry. And so the children of the village begin to roll these rags into balls and tie them together so that they can put become balls that they play with. You see them playing with this ball right there. As they throw the balls to one another, the children begin to cough up blood and returning to their home, they spread fever and plague, the, fir the fruit of Mustanath's curse. The town is entirely depopulated and the monastery, which relied on the townspeople, falls into ruin. And that's the happy ending of that story. And then in another village, a sadhu named Devidas, who's jealous of Mustanath's fame, demands that the yogi perform a trick, a miracle, without which he will not, Devi Das, Devi das will not instruct the townspeople to offer any alms to Mustanath and his fellow yogis. The townspeople obey Devi Das, they don't offer alms. And so the miracle that Mustanath then performs is to set the village on fire. And when Devi Das can't put the fire out, the villagers rebuke him and they venerate Mustanath, who then restores the village he had reduced to ashes back to wholeness. In the course of his life, Mustanath sort of goes up the ladder of Indian society. So now he's dealing in villages with low level abbots of monasteries. Sometime later in his life, he um, goes to a bandar, to a feast. Uh, offered by Surat Singh, the king of Bikaner in Western Rajasthan. And uh, the Brahmins are all eager to have some, some porridge, some soup. And they discover to their horror that there's a camel bone in their soup. And of course, Brahmins do not like camel bones in their soup and they're outraged and they, claim, they complain to Surat Singh. And uh, Masanath says, yes, I put that camel bone in the soup. And he pulls it out and the bone is pure gold. And then he says, have, an, have some watermelons. And they open the melons and they're full of pearls. So Surat Singh is very impressed that he, um, he um, what does he do? He offers him some sort of reward. At which point, Mustanath predicts, predicts the Sepoy mutiny of 1857 and the coming of the British Empire. Then again, rising up through the social political ranks of India, he goes to Delhi, where the uh, Mughal Emperor Shah Alam II, so this is at the very end of the Mughal Empire, has heard of this famous yogi, but Masanath is naked. And so Alam Shah sends an envoy to him and says, please take this shawl, it's precious. The, the emperor offers it to you. If you'll wear this shawl, then he'll have He'll invite you to his palace and have a hearing with you. So must not uh, throws the shawl into the fire and says, I don't obey anybody's orders. And the envoy is unhappy. He says, you just destroyed a beautiful shawl. And then must not with his fire tongs, pulls the shawl out of the fire and it's whole. And then he starts pulling many, many shawls out of the fire. So this is another trick, another miracle. Um, at that point, Matsnat tells his fellow yogis, play your horns backwards, those horns that they wear on their throat. I don't know what that means, 
but it's interesting. Again, it's about them playing their horns. And then immediately after they'd done that, he prophesied the fall of Alam Shah, who was blinded by a figure named Ghulam Qadar in 1788. And he prophesied the British Empire, sorry, the British takeover of, of what little remained of the Mughal Empire, which occurred in 1803. One of Mustanath's last miracles is to save a young Rajput prince named Man Singh, who has been besieged at Jalore by his evil cousin Bhim Singh, or his evil family member. Mustanath is the rightful heir to the Latore throne at Jodhpur, and he calls upon, in this hagiography, he calls upon Mustanath to help him, and Bhim Singh dies shortly thereafter. Man Singh takes initiation with Masnath and takes the throne. This is an interesting riff on the historical record. It was indeed the case that young Man Singh, the, one of the rivals for the throne of Jodhpur, was besieged by Bhim Singh's army at Jalore, and that Bhim Singh's untimely death allowed Man Singh to march on Jodhpur and take the throne. And it's also true that a Nath yogi intervened on his behalf. But here's how the British representative Colonel James Todd describes the events of 1803. And I quote from his book, Annals Antiqu and Antiquities of Rajasthan. Bhim Singh had destroyed every, almost every branch of the blood royal. And young Man was reduced to the last extremity and on the eve of surrendering himself and Jalor to this merciless tyrant, when he was relieved from his perilous situation. He attributed his escape to the intercession of the high priest of Marwar, the spiritual leader of the Rators. This hierarch bore the title of divinity or not G, and his praenomen of Deo or Deva was almost a repetition of his title, and both together, Deonat, cannot be better rendered than by Lord God. Whether the intercession of this exalted personage was purely of a moral nature, as asserted, or whether Raja Bhim was removed from this vain world to the heaven of Indra by other less miraculous means than prayer, is a question on which various opinions are entertained and then referring to Deonat, to this Nath yogi, such prophets are dangerous about the persons of princes who seldom fail to find the means to prevent their oracles from being demented. A dose of poison, it is said, was deemed a necessary adjunct to tender efficacious the prayers of the pontiff, and they conjointly extricated the young prince from a fate which was doomed inevitable and placed him on the regal cushion of Marwar. I'm surprised that this showed up right here. Well, anyway, this is when he has the yogis play their horns backwards. That's what you see here. This is a Nath yogi that I photographed at the Gorakhpur Monastery in 1984, 85. I'll say more about that monastery shortly. And this is a statue of a certain Udai knot uh, with his horn. This is what I went, thought I was going to show you. So the figure that Todd calls Deonat, um, Man Singh and the Rator Rajputs call uh, Ayas Dev Nath. So to continue with Todd's uh, chronicle, the gratitude of Man Singh knew no limits and the throne itself was exalted when Deonat condescended to share it with his master. Lands in every district were conferred, conferred upon the Nath, his income amounting to a tenth of the revenues of the state. During the few years he held the keys of his master's conscience, which were conveniently employed to unlock the treasury, he elected no less than 84 mandirs with monasteries adjoining them for his well-fed lazy disciples. This Cardinal, this Cardinal Wolseley of Marudesh exer exercised his hourly increasing power 
to the disgust and alienation of all but the infatuated prince. Um, so a couple words before I continue. First of all, you see that Man Singh is uh, subservient to the yogi. The yogi is standing over him. He's making him into a king. So the, the yogi, Ayasthevna, has the power here. Now, is it a yogi that's doing this or is it a god? Because he's got a halo around his head. And I'll come back to that. Uh, the second thing is Colonel Todd, he doesn't like the Nath yogis. He's, he's very angry about Ayasthev Nath. Just his language makes that clear. And that is because the Nath yogis were outmaneuvering the British at every turn, at every turn in Rajasthan, uh, putting their man on the throne as opposed to the one that the British were backing. And so the British were very unhappy with the Nath yogis in this part of South Asia. Now this, the this scenario of a yogi raising an untested prince to power and gaining in return the veneration of that prince and making that yogi in a sense the god of his kingdom is one that gets repeated across uh, much of India um, in medieval and modern Rajasthan and sub -Hil Himalayan India and Nepal. So here at Devalgar in Uttarakhand, you have the royal shrine of Goraknath from that tiny kingdom of the, this would be the 18th century. Uh, there's Goraknath there. At Parping in the Kathmandu Valley, Goraknath's footprints, <clears throat> although Buddhists take this to be the footprints of Rinpoche. And then at a site in um, Eastern Rajasthan called Padukatal, the samadhi, that is to say, the tumulus of Goraknath with his, again, his footprints. And this is his tie, his fire tongs, his chinti that's being represented. But returning to Man Singh's Jodhpur, the Maha Mandir, which became the centerpiece of the Nath Yogi presence in the kingdom, was constructed immediately after Man Singh's accession to the throne at an expense of over 50 lakhs of rupees to the royal treasury. Now, we've read Colonel Todd's version of these events. We've read how they were kind of made into Mustanath's uh, miracles in the Mustanath uh, Kicharitra. Man Singh himself wrote a hagiography of the Nath yogis and of these events in his own words. And in his own words, the yogi who miraculously intervened on his behalf was named Ayasthev Nath, but Ayasthev Nath was merely the human representative of Jalandar Nath. You remember I talked about him in my lecture on mountains. Now this is the image of Jalandar Nath as it appeared in the Maha Mandir in 1992 when I took this picture. Um, it's a replacement of a much more glorious image that did not look like uh, some sort of little doll. It was in jewels and gold and was fabulous. And it, it along with much, all of the contents of the Mahamandir were looted mainly by drunken Nath yogis who became the custodians of the temple after the fall of the Rators and the decline of the yogis. Um, so the place was in very bad shape by 1992. But to get back to Jalandar Nath then, so for Man Singh, Ayasthev Nath was the human intermediary for the god Jalandar Nath who actually performed the miracle that caused the death of Bhim Singh. And remember, here's how Jalandar Nath is pictured in one of these lovely miniatures that was commissioned by Man Singh in the years around the time of the construction of the Maha Mandir. And there's the God man, you see he's got a halo around his head, but he's a yogi, see the little horn? But that's him there. He's, he was the mountain before he became the yogi identified with the mountain. And what Man Singh writes in his version of the miracle was that on a morning, a few days before he was bound to surrender to Bhim Singh, the besieged Man Singh discovered Jalandar Nath's footprints in the living rock of the fortress at Jalor. So Jalandar Nath, who was the hill on which the fortress was built, he appears in his divine human form, leaving his footprints 
that Man Singh takes to be some kind of sign. So this was a human trace of the God of the mountain, the knot as mountain manifesting as the knot as yogi God. And so taking this to be a sign at Ayas Dev Nath's advice, the human yogi, he held off from surrendering to Bhim Singh. And it was this point, according to Man Singh himself, that he promised Ayas Dev Nath that if he were to gain the throne of Jodhpur, he would share his kingdom with the yogi, which is what he did. So the yogis lived high on the hog for quite a while after that, throughout the rule of Man Singh and a bit beyond. So this is the Mahamandir. You can see you see the the the, uh, the spire there. It's this one. It's the same one with the columns. And that's Jalandarnath, the divine yogi with the halo, being worshipped at the in the Garbhagriha of this Nath Yogi the temple. And who's worshipping him? These are Rajput princes. These are not yogis. They're Rajputs. Now here you have the same thing, the veneration of Jalandar Nath by probably Man Singh, but also you've got the yogis stick flanking the image. And here... Maharaja Man Singh calling on Ayas Dev Nath. There's the yogi, there's the prince uh, at the yogi's residence, not in the Mahamandir itself. There's the Mahamandir there. The yogi had his own palace. And in addition, this was after actually Ayas Dev Nath was killed with a gun uh, in the late 18 teens. And he was succeeded by Bhim Nath in, in the early 1820s. Man Singh, he lived into the 1830s, I believe. He had this lovely temple built for Bhim Singh, where probably Jalandar Nath sat before his image was stolen or plundered. But just some really lovely art of yogis and yogic postures, but also of yogi gods. Uh, this is a detail of that, just lovely imagery. So, and then later, uh, Ladunath, the, success, the successor of Bhimnath, holding court at Jodhpur. Once again, these are, this is a, a yogi, and these are Rajputs. So who's sitting on the throne? The yogi. Who's subserving it? The Rajputs. At the beginning of my talk, I implied that Indian yogis staged some kind of comeback in the 1990s. Note here that Mustanat's name is acronym for Massive Accredited Sacred Technical Novel Achiever Talented Helper on this billboard at the Astal Bohar site of his monastery in Rotak in Haryana state. The return of the down and out yogis and the not yogis specifically has taken two forms. On the one hand, at certain monasteries, and this is documented by my French colleague, Véronique Bourrier, who wrote a lovely book that's been translated into English called um, Monastic Wanderers. Uh, on the one hand, at certain monasteries, they have successfully gained the patronage lost with the fall of the princely states at independence by gaining favor with wealthy private individuals. In these cases, they managed this transition by rebranding themselves, not so much as miracle workers, but rather as alternatives to the Brahmin priesthood. They perform Vedic fire rituals, sponsor bhajan singing events, and so forth with great success. So in some respect, these Nath yogis have gone corporate, but of greater impact, has been the very muscular role that the Nath yogis have played in Indian politics. Already in the early 1990s, Avedya Nath, the Mahant, the abbot of the all important Gorakhpur monastery, was a member of the brain trust of the Vishva Hindu Parishad, the religious branch of the Hindu nationalist BJP, the Indian People's Party. In this respect, he was heir to the Nath Yogi legacy that began in December 1949, when his predecessor, not his immediate predecessor, 
Yogi Digvijay Nath placed images of Rama and his family in the Babri Mosque at Ayodhya. And as you no doubt know, that mosque was torn down by a Hindu mob in 1992. In the winter of eight, 1985, Abedyanath was my convenial host, congenial host during a week in which I was in residence at that Gorakhpur monastery. Before being appointed the Mahant there, Avedyanath was already a member of parliament representing the Gorakhpur district of northern Uttar Pradesh, a position he maintained even as he headed up that monastery. Avedyanath died in 2014. And here we see an image of him being venerated by Prime Minister Narendra Modi and another figure, dressed in saffron, as well as an image posted on that figure's website, that figure being the most powerful not yogi of modern history, Avedyanath, uh, sorry, Adityanath. So on Adityanath's website, you have Digvajayanath, who placed the images in the Babri Mosque, uh, and Avedyanath next to him. And of course, the Ram Jaram Bhumi temple that may some be saying someday be built over the ruins of the Babri Mosque. And Avedyanath, sorry, Adityanath uh, is behind all of that. That is to say, he supports all of that. Of course, Adityanath is the current chief minister of the state of Uttar Pradesh and in many respects, Prime Minister Modi's right hand man, especially in the promotion of the Hindu nationalist agenda. His rise to national prominence began in 1998 when Avedyanath, in poor health, had urged him to run for his seat in parliament, which Adityanath won. And then when Avedyanath died, Adityanath succeeded him as the Mahant of the Gorakhpur Monastery. So he had that political role from 1998, and then the mm, administrative role, the monastic role from 2014. And then in 2017, Prime Minister Modi appointed Adityanath the chief minister of Uttar Pradesh. And someday Adityanath may succeed um, Narendra Modi. This photo was taken at the time of Prime Minister Modi's launching of the massive urban renewal project in Varanasi which is his home district as a member of parliament. You see Adityanath standing behind him. That project called the Kashi Vishwanath Dham, now complete, has created a wide avenue of access to the venerable Kashi Vishwanath temple of Lord Shiva. That temple located immediately adjacent to a great mosque erected by the Mughal emperor Aurangzeb in the early 18th century has become a flashpoint for the Hindu nationalist cause in much the same way as was the Babri Mosque in Ayodhya. Both mosques were likely built over the ruins of a destroyed Hindu temple. And the rationale, as you know, behind the storming of the Babri Mosque was that the images of Lord Ram and Lord Ram himself was in some way trapped inside. In the light of which, the following tweet, or I should say, internet post posted by Prime Minister Modi on his website 11 days before this photo was taken. Sounds familiar. This is Modi's own words. This Kashi Vishwanath Dham, in a way, is the occasion of Bhole Baba, that is Shiva's liberation. Our Lord was closeted within the four walls. I am not sure for how long he was trapped and had tough time breathing. If you're not a Hindu nationalist, this is likely cause for alarm. My point here, however, and with this I will end my series of talks, is that the political hardball, sorry, the political hardball that the Nath yogis are currently playing is absolutely in line with their history and with the history of yoga and yogis in general. Yoga began as warfares and yogis have been soldiers and power brokers for well over a millennium. 
So while I am by no means condoning the current political turn the Nath yogis have taken, I must insist that they have remained true to form. Thank you.